I'd like to start the questions with you, to all of you, and ask you to give a short answer, and we can turn it into a dialogue as, as it starts to unfold. And by the way, there will be, we're going to talk for a half an hour or so, and then we're going to open it up to the audience to start asking questions. So please hold your, you know, as, as something comes up that you don't understand or you want to know about, hold the thought and we'll, you'll have a chance to um, answer, or we'll have a chance to answer for you. Okay, I'm going to, I was handed some uh, questions that are only the starting point, and the starting point then can take us into wh wherever the, the panel wants to go. The first question is, what do you think was Dorothy's attraction to Mexico? And why do you think she stayed there for long periods of time? But what was her attraction, and what took her back there, and what was it about Mexico that she was interested in? Anybody want to start? Uh, thank you very much. Um, I've recently reread re an article by a friend of mine, John Philip Santos, in which he was talking about that Mexico was all the rage at the time. And if we think about the conditions in the world with the beginning of World War II um, and the difficulties of working in Europe, it attracted many artists to Mexico. So it became a cultural nexus, and I think that was one of the major attractions for Dorothy at the time. Um, I'm gonna say a few things, uh, and I uh, also said it this morning in my, my talk. Dorothy had sharp antennae. She knew what was going on out there. And when she was in New York, um, the the largest and most important exhibition at the Museum of Modern Art was held, uh, 20 Centuries of Mexican Art. And I've, in fact, uh, the Santos article is footnoted in the book. Um, and as Carrie was noting, I mean, Mexico was in the air at that time. So Dorothy was in New York. Um, I mean, there was Rancho Grande furniture shows at Macy's there. There were. Um, exhibitions of paintings in the galleries. Uh, Jose Clemente Orozco was in situ painting the fresco at the Modern. Um, and she was in search of uh, already uh, truth and freedom and, and independence. She had already gone a little bohemian in, in New York, I think, all right, and dancing on the rooftops and going to all the exhibitions. But I think Mexico was really on her radar. Um, it was the hot spot in the world in terms of uh, the exiles coming from Europe from the Spanish Civil War, uh, political reasons, but also um, a hotbed of cultural, social, political ferment and creative ferment. So of course it was the magnet. Um, at the same time, we, we need to remember uh, Andre Breton was uh, brought there by Trotsky in 1940. Dorothy came to Mexico City a year later, however, but she became part of that circle. So, but that was already there between magic realism, between surrealism. There was the fourth international uh, surrealist exhibition in 1940. So there were a lot of elements there that of course would attract her. And uh, I think she was up for, you know, to grab any experience. So I think that was in initially why she wanted to go. I think Dorothy ended up in the honeypot. <laughs> to think of a, a young woman who's 20 to 20, early 20s, going to Mexico, and ending up in a circle like she ended up. That doesn't happen to very many people. I don't know the social circumstances, but to have people that were, a lot of them, old enough to be her parents, like Orozco and Rivera, embrace her, teach her, and help her to grow. Dorothy loved Mexico. 
Mexico. She loved the people. She learned to speak Spanish. She was embraced there in a way I don't think she could have been embraced in what other circle could she have fit at that time that would have embraced her so warmly. She would tell me stories about being with the people, and I, I wanted to know. I said, well, tell me about Paolo. Tell me about Rivera. And she, she would tell me stories. One of them that I liked the most was about Remedius Varro, who was someone I was very interested in. And she said that of all the women in that group, that Paolo was not someone that was warm to her and embraced her in the same way that Remedius did. The Remedius Varro, um, Um, was a great friend of Leonora Carrington's. Leonora was a little bit waggy, um, and, and um, very exciting, but very different. Remedius was, was gentle, and Leonora often had difficulties, and emotional difficulties, and she said that Remedius took care of her, and embraced her and was a good friend to her during every trial she ever had. And she, and she Remedius, embraced Dorothy too. Very interesting. And I didn't think I had much to say about this topic, but I just, <laughs> about Mexico, but I started thinking um, absolutely with the proximity of Texas to Mexico, so many artists went down there, and Mexico had an interesting relationship to Texas art because it was at once the other, but also Texas was formerly Mexico, and, and uh, Dorothy talked about that. People I can think of immediately off the top of my head who make, made a point of getting to Mexico, Jerry Bywaters regularly would go down there, um, Charles Williams in Fort Worth would go down regularly, and uh, Jean Owens went down, and of course Dorothy as well. Also Charles Umloff, of all people, went down in 1953 and watched bullfighting. Also, but I, I just thought of something I want to talk to Susie about at dinner tonight. It, there is an interesting relationship between Mexico and, and Texas, and uh, Octavio Medellin talked about it. Octavio Medellin, being Hispanic, actually had trouble when they went to Mexico. And yet, when Dorothy went down there, she would talk about how, yes, it was an old-fashioned in terms of women, but she was embraced like an artist. So she felt like none of the problems, maybe, none of the problems she had in the United States were, were hampering her in Mexico because they had such a reverence for artists. So I thought it's important to say it's a, it's a complicated issue, but I think Dorothy got, got the best of it, maybe. Well, that get, gets me into it. the next question, and that is, in your opinion, how does Dorothy Hood compare to her contemporaries of, during her life in American art? And do you think that she believed she was in competition with other artists, be they female or male. Uh, you want me to go ahead? You want me to take this? <laughs> Boy, have, that's a tough one. Okay, all right. Um, I I don't think. I mean, this is my gut feeling, you know. And I've pretty much lived with this woman for the last four years, twenty four seven. But you know, and. Well, actually, at this time, Lynn and I are the only ones who knew Dorothy, and Lynn knew her, I mean, is probably her oldest and dearest friend. But um, I, I never felt that Dorothy was in competition with, with other artists. I think she, um, uh, she had absolute belief in the validity of her art. I do believe that. And, um, made great sacrifices, uh, at sometimes made, uh, as we all do, poor decisions, uh, not only in her art, but in men, and living, you know, those kinds of life decisions that would cross over into art. Um, this is what uh, fascinated me about Dorothy, however, in 
going through the thousands of pages of the you know, correspondence and archives. And, and I can say that because Dorothy would keep every letter she wrote, she would keep carbon copies. Um, or she would, you know, or mimeographed. I mean, everything was, you know, it was all in boxes, but it was all there. And what really impressed me is that coming from, you know, Bryan, Texas, being born, being raised in Houston, um, you know, going to RISD, Mexico City, or whatever, you know, she wasn't on what we know in this age as a career track. Okay, however, I mean, even in Mexico City, I don't know how she did it. I guess with a, you know, an old royal typewriter that she would rent somewhere and, you know, between Puebla and, and Mexico City to get the mail out or whatever. But from the very beginning, she would uh, write, I mean, uh, artists across the country, directors, gallery dealers. She was almost like a guy a male artist at the time, in making contacts. It's like, I kept wondering, how did she know how to do this? You know, it's something that you really kind of go through with experience, but she started out that way. So if there was any feeling of, you know, a competitive nature, I didn't feel it in the art, although she was always pushing herself to go on and always, um, I think, upset whether she didn't have the, you know, the materials, like living in Mexico, to be able to paint, that she was living in such poor, you know, next to poverty conditions. But uh, somehow she was always able to keep one up, and I think that was it. And there are letters from her mother that would keep pushing her, like, well, why didn't you apply for this Guggenheim, or why didn't you do this, or, you know, that, so that was kind of the, you know, the push for her, but, so in terms of getting her art out there or getting her name, and I think, and this goes back to the Mexico question too, I think she felt that she had a better chance being in Mexico, kind of as a, our, one of our first transborder artists, that she would get more attention early on um, in the United States, and there were, but with the correspondence between her and Royal Farnham at RISD at the time, of course, he was saying, well, be careful. We don't want our you know, American artists going to Mexico and coming back little Mexicans. I mean, but he really me, said that. But let me ask you something. Which me, goes back to Katie's thing about yeah, uh, but artists going here, together. You'll notice that there's one thorn among four roses, OK? So I, I have to be the thorn, and I'm a male. <laughs> and I'm a male in a business in which males have a lot of power. I acknowledge that. Thank God it's changing. I'm 100% for it. But I want to get back. I know the art historical stuff, but I want to kind of be hard even on the men. And it seems to me that most of the famous artists, even those that have been written about so much, even some of you up here that have written about mainly, at least on the bios, there's so many men. And it seems to me that what is so interesting in her career is that if you walk through that gallery, those galleries, and you see that art, and my question to all of you, it, it, it's even visceral to personal, and that is, is, does that stuff hold up against every one of these guys? And I say, of course it does. That's what I don't understand. I don't understand. Does she hold up, or is it me? Now, we're probably going to have a unified front here, but it's like, wait a minute, something is wrong. Well, something I, is wrong if she doesn't I just wanted up. to say that in their lifetimes, Remedios Varro, Leonor Carrington, and Frida Kahlo took back seats to the men. So they, the research and scholarship and knowledge and understanding of those women artists, even though they were, and Maria Izquierdo, even though they were embraced in the art world, they were second fiddle in their lifetimes. So it's a more recent phenomenon that we have placed them in scholarship the way that we have. So is that what's going on here then? I hope so. 
See, that, that's what I find, and remember, I'm the moderator in here. They're not talking. Okay, Lynn. Can I go? Well, I think that was fantastic, and I agree, and the cogs are really turning here. Um, look at early Jackson Pollock and early Mark Rothko. It's, it's all spiritual. It's, it's Indian-related, Native American. Early Rothko is all about the mythical. Sure, the later stuff is too, but what do they get famous for? They get famous for the abstract expressionist gesture that is the automatic or the, the color field. And I, I really do, um, I'm very much a student of studying in the 1980s and 1990s when we started looking at how abstract expressionism began to dominate world art, and it was partly political. To say that these, this gesture was something that demonstrated American freedom. And so there was a lot of reasons why abstract expressionism had to represent America. And you can call it a conspiracy or whatever, but it happened, and Greenberg was right there supporting it. And it's absolutely, I agree with what Lynn says, that um, Dorothy's work is more about the spiritual in a way. Something what, what, what Lynn and Katie are saying, and I think it's also important to realize, and I write about it in the book, that um, uh, there are, were at l minimum 25 years correspondence between Dorothy and Dorothy Miller, the first curator of Museum of Modern Art, as well as uh, uh, many decades of correspondence with Marion Willard, who owned the Willard Gallery, which was the most one of the most prestigious galleries in New York at the time. Through Dorothy Miller, uh, Dorothy Hood got an <coughs> exhibition at Willard Gallery in 1950. Well, Marion Willard at the time really specialized in the kind of spiritual art that we're talking about, and she recognized that in Dorothy and gave her, I mean, that was a, extremely rare for a, a woman from Texas living in Mexico. And Dorothy kind of, you know, like, gosh, am I considered a Mexican artist or am I an American artist here? Or, you know, the, the, and, and at that time, you really did have to kind of draw the lines. But to have a show at the Willard Gallery, 1950, Marion Willard at the time was showing David Smith, Paul Clay, um, but also Mark Toby and Morris Graves, all right? who were very much spiritualists. Through that, um, Marion Willard later on uh, wrote letters and um, on Dorothy's behalf uh, to when she had her first trip to Europe in the early 70s uh, to meet Mark Toby, all right? And because they thought they would get along because of the spiritual nature of, of both their works. Um, but uh, I w also want to say it was, it was um, uh, kind of an anomaly when she did have that show. 
and it was not received all that well in New York. And I have to say, it was also by male art critics, and again, and we'll get into that, it was a male-dominated world. Art critics, you know, most of the directors, the artists, but at the time, and it, and it really hurt Dorothy, all right? It was her first New York exhibition, and she retreated to Puebla uh, for a few years and had to rethink her painting. And could she go? And it was a kind of a crossroads. You know, is, was she going to keep on the spiritual's path, or did she have to include more abstraction, formalism? So there was a lot going on there. I'd like to make a comment, uh, something that is in the catalog or in the book, and that is that she had an encounter. She met with Clement Greenberg. Now, Clement Greenberg is the guy who defined formalist art, in my opinion. He's one of the great writers to define the field, the color, the space, the reference to the edge, all of the things that those of us that love modern art are interested in. The relationship between those two never went anywhere. And that's because of exactly what you're saying, is that he was about art about art the analysis, the creation of beauty as it's, in its, found in its formal constructs. She was about a, something that appeared to be similar to what he was talking about, but was way beyond it. So they really could, they weren't talking to each other. She was being honest about what she was believing in. And that kind of takes me to the next question that I was handed, and that is... Can I always say one oh, thing oh, about Greenberg? Oh, I'm sorry. Oh, oh, yeah, well, yeah you, and I always I do that. I want to say one thing about Greenberg, because uh, Bill was struck by the fact that I've written on Andrew Wyeth, and actually okay. compare him to Jackson Pollock. Late in life, in the 80s, Clement Greenberg said, that this formalist stuff, he liked it because that was the direction history was going. It wasn't necessarily his personal taste, ha. Huh? Um, but he said the, uh, the, the artist he really loved was Andrew Wyeth. And I think in some way he actually was being honest. And in a way, if you look at the detail of Dorsey's work, there is, does bear a little bit of relationship to that real meticulous detail of Wyeth. And you can see, bringing it back to Greenberg, why he would actually like her work. <laughs> we're going to go, start the juices flowing here now. OK, so there's a chapter in the book. And again, this I had no idea this was going on. But in these boxes were all these co correspondence. It was like a tennis match, a ping pong ball going back and forth between Dorothy and, and Clement Greenberg, or you know, dear Clem, Clem as she called him. But, uh, and everything at that time, you know, it was, you know, postcards back and forth and, and letters. And um, it, it was still, at that time, Clement Greenberg's star was kind of on the wane, all right? But he could still make or break careers. And especially for, you know, a painter living in Houston at the time. And let's not forget at that time, Houston was known as a color field school. I mean, Colorfield City. E.A. Carmine was curator there at the time, and there were Colorfield paintings in a lot of those uh, River Oaks and Memorial area homes and being added to the collection. So it was to her advantage that she, you know, kept up this kind of very playful and I'm going to say it sexual kind of play back and forth with Clinic Greenberg that I don't think really went anywhere. But the thing that I did, did, that did strike me was that he was criticizing Dorothy for her hard contour lines and for being too feminine, all right? And she took great offense to that. And I mean, you can read it in the book. It's all there. But it was like, this Queen of Sheba, if you think you're no, you know, and I'm going to have another beer on that. And I mean, it was a bandering back and forth and back and forth. But um, I think what it is too, Clement Greenberg, you know, making a lot of careers and whether Dorothy was going to accept that or not. You know, would she accept that advice? If she had accepted that advice, would that have moved her forward? Another Greenberg painter, Walter Darby Bannard, there's a letter 
from him in the archive that says, you know, Dorothy, do not paint the void. The void literally means nothing. But Dorothy, being the independent soul, didn't pay any attention. You know, she was convinced and she was determined to follow and pursue a personal language. I just want to ask, ask a question that's not on the panel. I mean, it's not on my notes, and that is, well, in your opinion then, was it being a sexist thing because there was a group, a guy, one guy, and there were a group of them. Listen, the art form crowd of which you, weren't you a part of it? A, a, a peripherally? Yes. No, okay. Yes. So Barbara Rose was definitely part of it. Yeah. Okay. They had identified the truth. Now all of, everybody in this room, if you're not a modernist, you have your own opinions about truth, right, when it comes to modern art. Okay, we understand that. But if, you, if you're interested about truth, then was Hood being honest, or were the guys in New York being honest, and was there any way that she was gonna be able to get there? Are you saying that she couldn't get there because of her convictions? They wouldn't allow her in. So it was more than it was more than men, it was an attitude that was pervasive in Well, she had art. a, well, and, and Dorothy had an attitude. I mean, you know, I mean, Dorothy, that's what I was saying, too. It's about, you know, she made some poor decisions. You know, she could get her back up. See, Lynn knows this. She sabotaged herself many times, you know. There are people in the audience, Deborah, you know that too. She, she sabotaged herself many times and just like, you know, when you say don't burn your bridges or whatever, she, she didn't hesitate. Now, did that hurt her? I think it did maybe, you know, uh, in certain ways, especially, you know, if she wanted to break through that. Now, let's remember too, at that time, it was extremely important to break through. You know, of course now, I mean, at, at this point in, in art, I mean, I think, and we're coming to agree with this, that, um, you know, the, the most powerful art isn't necessarily being made in the major city centers. To me, the most powerful art that we're seeing is coming from the edge in isolation, you know, to have a very genuine voice. But back then, my goodness, if you didn't play ball and, and follow the rules, you were either in or out. Good point. Okay, we're going to do one more question, and it's going to be more of a personal one for each one of them to answer, because whatever they answer is correct. And that is, Dorothy liked to work in various mediums, collage, drawing, and painting. What do you believe, personally, without talking about monetary value or all of, you know, the big against the small, what do you think, where do you find most of her masterworks. Well, I have to say that I hadn't seen her drawings before, and I am absolutely enchanted with her ability to maintain such a meticulous, linear quality. I am just kind of, it's mind-boggling how she was able to create all of those drawings. They are amazing. So those are my personal favorite. Well, I've held all of these works in my head that are out there and more for four years. So I replay them all the time. And I'm amazed um, after you know, so many years and thinking about them, uh, when I saw them in the museum here, it was a very emotional experience. So for me, it, there, it's, it's a two-part question. Um, of course, the scale, the large, the epic 10-foot paintings. You know, Dorothy told me one time in her studio when I asked her, you know, what did she want the viewer to take away with this work? And she says, well, I want, to, want the viewer to hear the lion's roar and the drums beat. So when I stand in front of those 10-foot paintings, I feel this kind of reverberation in my stomach like the rocket's taking off. And then psychologically, the space behind the mind's eye and dreams and the two come together and it just transports me. So for me, some of the major 10-foot paintings, 
But on the other hand, the drawings also astonish, continue to astonish me. They have the precision of a surgeon's scalpel. Now, she did those standing up, so the intensity is truly felt every mark. And every mark on those drawings truly reveal the spirit of its maker. It was about, about 84, 84, 85. 84, 85. Yeah. I introduced him to Dorothy, and he loved the collages. He loved the more than the paintings. And I couldn't believe that. Uh, Dorothy and I talked about it. I know that her paintings meant everything to her. And I saw those paintings through her eyes. I think that Dorothy took all those formal qualities and turned it into poetry, and all that poetry is in the paintings. She used paint like poets use words. She made metaphors about our very souls in those paintings, and I don't, I don't think anything surpasses them. I like the drawings, too. <laughs> I love the drawings. I put two of them in my book deliberately. Uh, one that was in, they're both here. Thank you, Susie. <laughs> because one of the points of my book was to say, look, these are Texas mid-century artists, but they were active all over the United States, and they're in major collections. So I deliberately wanted Dorothy Hood works that were in the Brooklyn Museum and the Philadelphia Museum of Art. So I never saw them until last night. I will also say, I want to make sure I don't escape tonight without commenting on what a remarkable exhibition this is. I think we all know it. I'm astonished that this show even happened. And just for me to get two small drawings photographed and into my book cost me hundreds and hundreds of dollars because they had never been out of the vault, they'd never been photographed, Philadelphia didn't even know they had them, and thank you Baylor for helping me to pay for that, but it was hugely costly just to get those images in the book. I can't even imagine what it took to get this show together, and I also want to say we mentioned Robert Storr earlier when Margot Sawyer was here, the great Robert Storr, who's put on so many incredible exhibitions. I heard him talk at UT a few years ago, and he said, oh, just give up doing monographic shows of a single artist. It's too expensive. <laughs> and for all these reasons, to see Dorothy's work, I think part of the reason I like the drawings more is because I can handle them. I think the more time I spent with the, large, the paintings, the more I'll start to understand them. I find them overwhelming. Um, and to be able to see them here in one place is honestly nothing short of miraculous. And so thank you to the museum and to Susie and to Bill for, for getting this collection here in the first place. But I still have to say drawings. <laughs> thank you. To me, what was so special about those comments is the, the diversity and the, the answers and the reasons. And that's what makes art so special. Now, we have a few minutes left before we have to close this for the evening. And I'd like to open it up for questions to the whole panel or to any particular person. Oh, yes. Go ahead. Before we met today, Susie was asking me to say a little bit about the pre-Columbian influence. And so if you look at her work, you can see actual images of pre-Columbian art, as well as titles of abstract works like Montalban, places that she went. I wanted to say that the discovery of pre-Columbian art didn't really happen until Frederick, Frederick Edwin Church of the Hudson River School started collecting pre-Columbian art. It then went into ethnographic museums, 
So it's very pivotal that Dorothy was with these artists like Diego Rivera Orozco, artists who were trying to reclaim the pre-Columbian past as an artistic rather than an ethnographic tradition. So I think it had a very meaningful impact on her work. That's fantastic. Thank you, Carrie. That's great. Okay, we'll open it up now.